Come, come, Holy Spirit, come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It wasn't until the early 15th century that John the Baptist became a favorite subject of artists. He's primarily portrayed as the baptizer and the pointer. Magnificent Renaissance paintings depict John baptizing Jesus at the Jordan River. But even more paintings, altarpieces, and sculpture portray John pointing an elongated finger, E.T.-like, towards Jesus or nothing at all. Leonardo da Vinci painted two works in which John points heavenward and is the only subject on the canvas. It's as if his role as a saint is immortalized as the official pointer. Well, where does this gesture come from? Our scripture this morning, of course. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. It's ingrained in us <clears throat> that it's rude to point. But I can't imagine John standing there, arms at his side, making an awkward, tilting head gesture. Look, there's the Son of God. No, right? He's the herald. He was the forerunner. He was, would emphatically point in the direction of the Son of God. John was always deflecting attention away from himself and onto Jesus. As he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. The pointer's story winds throughout the Gospels, connected to Jesus almost from conception. John precedes him, identifies him, baptizes him, defers to him, doubts him, and in death is affirmed by him as the greatest of the prophets. In fact, he and Jesus force us to ask, what in the world is the prophetic, and how do we discern who speaks for God and who is just plain crazy, a shyster or a phony? Then and now, pursuing the prophetic is dangerous business. In the end, like many prophets, John winds up dead and venerated. He had no filter and refused to be silent about the sins of the rich and famous. He was the progenitor of speaking truth to power. At best, prophets like John help us to get our bearings in the world. They throw cold water and hard sayings in our faces and force us to examine our values and those of the culture around us. At worst, they are propped up by fearful and adoring sycophants desperate to maintain their power structures. But even worse, Pursuing the prophetic may mean that we find excuses to silence the messengers, manipulating and dismissing our way out of their warnings. From the pointer to the Nazi resistor Dietrich Bonhoeffer and to Martin Luther King Jr., the prophetic landscape is strewn with the bodies of the dead, some of whom though silenced, still speak. Their words, etched in stone and in our consciousness, are still relevant, still shaming, still resounding. Why? Because they come from the source, that of God's eternal truth. Truth, and only truth, can bear the weight of history. John's Gospel also tells us that after John pointed to Jesus and said, look, here is the Lamb of God, two of John's disciples left him to follow Jesus. When Jesus noticed them following him, he turned and asked, 
What are you looking for? This is the first recorded question Jesus asks his disciples and one for the ages. What are you looking for? I believe that true prophets, prophets such as King, whose life and witness we celebrate this weekend, did not see, did not see what they were looking for and what the Spirit's nudging, the Spirit's will, they risked everything to find it. I've been thinking about this question all week, and I'm not sure what we're looking for. Or we're too complacent, or tired, or afraid to go search. In your heart and in your secret, quiet places, what are the hungers that get you out of bed in the morning or on your knees at night? As you said goodbye to an old year and welcome a new one, what are you hoping for, asking for, looking for, whether it be in your spiritual life, your professional life, or your civic life? Do you know? Do I know? Perhaps we still haven't found what we're looking for. National Public Radio embarked on a fabulous series last year called American Anthem, in which it examined songs that rouse, unite, celebrate, and call us to action. You twos, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, was featured in July. The song was released in 1987 on the Joshua Tree album, and U2's lead singer and songwriter Bono, Bono sorry, has referred to it as a gospel song with a restless spirit. Now the song begins, and I'm going to ask Daryl in just a second if he can join me in a few licks here. The song begins, I have climbed the highest mountains, I have run through the field, only to be with you, only to be with you. Come on, Daryl, can you help me out here? How does it go? You guys know this, right? Only to be, if I could sing, I would. Only to be with you. All right, thank you. You got it. Everyone knows that, right? It goes on, I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls, these city walls only to be with you. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I believe in the kingdom come, then all the colors will bleed into one, bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds, you loosed the chains, carried the cross of my shame. Oh, my shame. I know, I believe it. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Joshua Rothman, a writer for The New Yorker, was interviewed as part of this story because he wrote a piece in 2014 called The Church of U2, making the case that this song is a potent contemporary hymn, partly because of the uncertainty expressed in Bono's lyrics. It's a song about searching for meaning or transcendence, he says. And to me, the most interesting thing about it is that you don't find it. It's about the search. It's a song that celebrates wanting. Now, in 1988, there was this documentary called Rattle and Hum. It was made about this album and this song Bono and Edge and the band go to Harlem, and they film a song at the Harlem Greater Calvary Baptist Church in preparation for a performance at Madison Square Garden. Promise me you will thank me today when you leave here. Go home, Google NPR. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, and watch this video. It will make you cry. The yearning this song describes in my mind, is eternal. So does this mean that we may never find on earth in this life what we're looking for? Is this simple existential question one we will wrestle with all of our lives? 
Or is the answer right before our eyes? Authentic prophets don't sit around debating the philosophical nature of this question. Martin Luther King himself said, a man who won't die for something is not fit to live. When Jesus offers the disciples the invitation to come and see, he's offering us an invitation to leave our comfortable vantage points and dare to believe that just maybe we have been limited and wrong in our certainties about ourselves, our capabilities, about God, each other, and about the world. To come and see is to pro approach all of life with a grace-filled curiosity to believe that we are holy mysteries to each other, worthy of fuller exp exploration, worthy of acceptance, worthy of forgiveness, worthy of love. To come and see is to have the very best that lies hidden within us and the very worst called out and called forth. Of course, seeing is always selective. We have choices when it comes to what we look for, what we prioritize, what we name, and what we call out in each other. We also have choices in what we refuse to see and to look for. The selves we present to the world are layered and messy, and it takes both love and patience to sift through those layers and to find what good lies at the core. But there is power in that sifting, too. Something healing and holy happens to us when the chafe of our own sin is burned away. It is only then that the cataracts of injustice can be corrected. Debbie Thomas, who writes for the blog Journey with Jesus, wrote that today's gospel story is not just about our sin. At its core, it's about what Jesus sees. It's a story about Jesus' way of looking about what becomes possible when we dare to experience his gaze, respond to his call. I believe that what we're looking for is love. It's more than romantic or filial. It's God's love. And while we know in theory that it's unconditional and smothered on each and every being created in God's image, we can't see it for ourselves or in ourselves, and then we can't imagine it bestowed in equal measure upon our enemies. So what are you looking for? What are you looking for when you approach the people around you? Is your seeing fear-filled or narrow? Is it spacious and brave? Are you looking to judge? or looking to bless. This very truth about love is why we're still looking. The quest is eternal because only until we meet love incarnate face to face upon our deaths will the search be consummated. When Martin Luther King received his Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo in 1964, he said these words, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. And this, my friends, is why John the Baptist continues to point the way.